Uh, I'm Gene Myers, and I have the uh, privilege and pleasure to uh, introduce our next uh, speaker, Dr. Herbert Silverstein. I feel well qualified to uh, do that because I've known Herb since, uh, I figure, around 1957. So uh, we were both students at um, Temple Medical School, uh, and uh, I met, I was a uh, second year student, and Herb was a first year student when we um, worked together in a research lab in my uh, father's department. My dad was uh, uh, the, the chairman of uh, otorhinology at uh, Temple Medical School, and so Herb and I became acquainted during that time. And uh, then uh, after I graduated from uh, uh, Temple, I um, uh, did a uh, residency here at uh, Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, and uh, I uh, got a call from uh, Herb during that time, and uh, he said, uh, well, you know, I'm going to follow you and uh, be a, a resident in uh, uh, otolaryngology, and uh, I'm going to stay here at Temple. So he said, no, 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 don't do that. I said, come on up here to Mass Science here. Man, I said, you'll love it. They're partying around the clock here and <laughs> just having a ball. It's very loose, and you'll, you'll love it. Well, uh, I guess I talked him into it because, lo and behold, uh, he appeared on the scene. And uh, rather than uh, partying around the clock, he uh, was an excellent resident and was uh, renowned for the, his uh, innovative approach to uh, otology in particularly. And uh, he worked with uh, uh, Dr. Shuknek. He taught Dr. Shuknek quite a few tricks and uh, innovations in uh, otological surgery and distinguished himself uh, even as a resident. Uh, Herb and I intersected later on at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. We were together for a couple of years in the 1970, and uh, uh, after a few years, uh, I went to um, uh, University of Pittsburgh to become the chairman, and uh, Herbie uh, headed south in a nice way, of course. And uh, he's <laughs> distinguished himself during that time. Uh, he's established the Silverstein Institute, and which has uh, produced uh, uh, a lot of uh, scientific information and also trained lots and lots of people. In fact, Herb has a uh, anniversary that is celebrating of 50 years in practice and having trained 50 uh, fellows in uh, uh, otology. So uh, Herb has uh, contributed a great deal. Uh, he's a distinguished uh, uh, re uh, resident here and also a uh, distinguished graduate and has one become one of the leaders in the uh, field of otology. So, Herb, come on up here and tell us your story. Gene, thank you very much for the kind comments. Did I want to talk about why I love Mass Pioneer? Sixty-one years ago, I walked into the Mass Ioneer as a first-year resident applicant. Mass Ioneer was considered one of the best hospitals to train in otolaryngology. I never thought it possible to be accepted there, and no way could I envision I would be standing here at the 200th anniversary celebration. Gene Myers was the first year ahead of me at Temple University and advised me to apply at Mass Ioneer, where he was training. I was ready to go to Temple University for my residency with Gene's father, David Myers, who was head of the NT department there. My father was professor of neurology at Temple and encouraged me to do research while in medical school, and I studied the vestibular system in cats. I felt so honored to be accepted by Harold Shuknick as a resident, especially because I was an, an hour and a half late for the interview. <laughs> I got lost driving around Boston. Fortunately, I had a successful interview, and we had research using cats in common. HFS was a world-class histopathologist and author of three editions of Pathology of the Ear. He invented the fat wire prosthesis for otosclerosis. He was a great teacher, surgeon, mentor, and he always called me Herbie. 
And I owe my career mainly to Gene Myers. He was a mentor and friend and coached me through medical school and residency, and he tried to prevent me from making mistakes and screwing up. I was always interested in research and development, and I always liked to find the best and improved ways of doing things. I searched for ways to do procedures easier using a more direct approach that was effective. Dr. Shuknek encouraged me to do research while I was in residency, and he said, Herbie, I want you to be an expert in Meniere's disease, and I want you to have a lab to do research on inner ear fluids, which I think has something to do with the disease process. So here's $5,000 to get started until you get your NIH grant. Also, Herbie, it's very important that you make a contribution to science. I had a research fellow and a technician to manage while I was a full-time resident. Mike Paparella knew Sigur Rauch at Dusseldorf, Germany, and said I had to learn microchemical techniques from him. HFS sent me to Germany for three weeks to Sigur Rauch to learn how to analyze small samples of inner ear fluid. I worked till 10 and 11 at night, many nights, and developed a diagnostic labyrinthotomy procedure, which is also called the inner ear tap, where we took inner ear fluid from patients to help diagnose acoustic neuromas. We could diagnose an acoustic neuroma because there was a high perilymph protein concentration versus in many years disease that had a high potassium levels because of the endolymphatic hydrops. And this was all before MRI and CT scans. One day I was doing a, an experiment on a cat trying to simulate a Meniere's vertigo attack by putting endolymph type fluid in the inner ear. And the, which was rupture of the inner ear, excuse me. <coughs> HFS theory was that a rupture of the inner ear caused a flooding of the perilymph space with high potassium endolymph that caused the vertigo attack. The cat developed nystagmus like a Meniere's attack, and I was so excited that I ran down to the private office where HFS was seeing patients and interrupted him and said, you've got to come to the lab and see what I did. And he left the patients, and he came to the lab with me up four floors. The energy at Mass Eye and Ear was intense constantly looking for better ways to improve patients' quality of life. As a first-year resident with Roger Lindemann, a second-year resident, we developed the arrow tube, which was one of the first flange tubes to aerate the middle ear in chronic serous otitis media. The tube was designed to stay in place for months. At the same time, I developed an anesthetic of the tympanic membrane, which was panicane base powder dissolved in alcohol which we still use today for myringotomies. Danny, Mil Danny Miller, who was a surgeon at Mass Eye and Ear, had residents on his service. Dr. Shuknik told us that residents were supposed to be doing a significant portion of the surgery on private patients. Danny was doing a tint mastoid one day, and after several hours, he left the room and turned it over to his associate, Tom Klein. I didn't get to do anything during the case, and I complained bitterly to Dr. Klein while he was kicking me under the table. <laughs> Little did I know that the scrub nurse was Dr. Miller's personal nurse. Well, she went back to Danny and told him what I said, and from then on, Danny blackballed me until Gene Myers, who was Danny's favorite, saved me, and Danny then let me start doing procedures again. Sunday school was a great part of the residency training. Gene was doing monkey business, training monkeys on Sunday afternoon, and he discovered by accident that Dr. Shuknek was looking at temporal bone slides on Sunday morning with his research fellows. Gene invited himself to the teaching session, sessions and told me to come also. We had a great time looking at slides, trying to correlate the clinical picture with the pathology. At lunchtime, HFS would take us to the Union Oyster Bar where he would smoke a large cigar. <laughs> These were the golden years of otology and helped shape my career. 
Other people who helped mold me were Dick Gasick, Bill Montgomery, Mike Paparella, and Nelson Chiang. Bill Ga Dick Gasick was two years ahead of me in residency. He was a great teacher and researcher. After residency, he went into the private office with HFS and Monty. When House did the first cochlear implant, I said this was the most important breakthrough in our specialty. And Dick said, buzz, buzz, buzz. Well, we had an altercation after that about the cochlear implant. <laughs> One day I asked Nelson a research question, and he said, sure, I'll see you here at 3 a.m. in the morning. And of course I went there at 3 a.m. My fellow residents were Joel Bernstein. My, my fellow residents were Joel Bernstein, who was very interested in research, and we did many projects together. Joel went into practice in Buffalo, and Charlie Gross became professor at the University of Virginia. Johnny Knowles went to Vermont to practice. Peter Van Orman went into practice in the Boston suburb. When I finished residency, I was obligated to enlist in the Army for two years. But I was able to keep the research lab going at the Mass Ioneer while I was serving in Hawaii. After two years, I came back to join the private office for three years. During my teaching years at Mass Ioneer, I had a great pleasure of taking K.J. Lee, a resident, through his first timbinoplasty. K.J. Lee was the first one to use computer punch cards to do clinical research. This was before computers. I knew then that K.J. would be a great leader of our field. I then joined Gene Myers at the University of Pennsylvania, and Gene got the chairmanship at Pittsburgh and wanted me to come join him. At Penn, I met Jeff Harris, who was a medical student, and told him to go to Mass Ioneer for his training. Look what a great career he's had. In 1973, I decided to retire from academic medicine at 38 and moved to Sarasota. Dr. Shuknek was appalled at my choice. He said, what's a Sarasota? I never heard of it. And she said, you're no longer my favorite son. And he wouldn't talk to me for years. But I won back his respect after I invited him to be the guest of honor at our first neurological surgery of the ear meeting in Sarasota in 77. HFS surprised me at my 20th anniversary party at being in Sarasota by coming to roast me. He had details of my entire career. When moving to Sarasota, I was not welcomed by the ENT physicians. They told me another ENT was not needed in this small town. But if I did come, I would be on my own with no coverage. I had no money, an old Corvette, and one suitcase. There was no place to rent, but I found a thousand foot square foot storage closet in an ortho office that I renovated. The bank, the bank lent me $100,000 on my signature, and I took call 24-7, but somehow I persevered, but retirement didn't work out too well. This was my first office. Only kidding. <laughs> I started the nonprofit organization, the Erie Research Foundation, in 1979. This was the original 1,000 square foot building. Our mission was to do research into finding better ways to treat hearing loss and vertigo, education of physicians and the public, and community surface taking care of indigent patients. This is our 49th fellow, Alan Young, who's now in practice in Las Vegas. The clinical fellowship began in 1983, and this year we celebrated 50 fellows trained and 50 years in practice in Sarasota. This is the Shuknet Conference Center with pictures of the 50 fellows. Here's a picture of the fellows at our recent 50-50 celebration. This is the 30,000 square foot building that we built in 203. Gene visited uh, me in, uh, at the Silverstein Institute. Let's see, I just want to go. Now, after 50 years, Gene and I are back together endowing chairs at Mass Ioneer. Gene recently visited me at the Silverstein Institute. 
Mass Eye and Ear launched my career and gave me a foundation to develop new treatments and surgical procedures, some of which I would like to show you now. For long-term middle aeration, the spat silicone tube was designed to go through the bone of the ear canal into the middle ear. This procedure was patented and still being used today. Here's a drawing of the procedure. And this is a patient that, uh, of Dr. Wazen that had the tube placed in 2017. These tubes stayed in place for many years. Training young doctors to do surgery near the facial nerve prompted me to improve the Geza nerve stimulator to a facial nerve monitor. There was a sensor uh, attached to the face and a SACS device that electrifies the drill to help identify the facial nerve when drilling close to the facial nerve. One day I was doing a biopsy of a posterior fossa tumor through the retrolab approach which is going into the posterior fossa between the labyrinth and the lateral sinus. And I noticed that I could see the eighth nerve easily, and the retrolab vestibular nerectomy was born. This approach was improved when we entered the posterior fossa behind the lateral sinus. 250 procedures were done. This stopped the vertigo and preserved hearing in many patients. Here's a picture of the right vestibular nerve being cut. The nerve separates after transaction. Dr. Norell, a neurosurgeon, and I organized the first neurological surgery of the ear meeting in 1977, where 50 neurosurgeons and 250 otologists came together. After that meeting, we had five meetings every other year. In those days, the neurosurgeons didn't think much of ENT. In fact, they thought we were nose pickers and tonsil snatchers. Dr. Norell, had significant impact in creating the team approach to skull-based surgery. At first, he wanted to stop me from doing neurologic procedures because I was invading his turf. In fact, Dr. Norell canceled my first middle fossa vestibular nerectomy. The next day, he checked, out, checked me out with Dr. Uh, Dr. Ogerman at Mass General and Dr. Tom Langford at the University of Pennsylvania. And they told him, don't stop Silverstein. He's qualified to do the neuroodologic procedures. So after that, he let me do the procedure that he canceled, and we became a team for 25 years and wrote many papers. In 1996, I developed the microwick, which allows patients to instill, self-instill medications into the inner ear for a month. It's used with own eardrops to reduce symptoms of Meniere's disease, pressure in the ear, tinnitus, and vertigo. It is also used in sudden deafness along with oral pre prednisone. Here's a picture of the tube in place. I developed a laser stamp procedure for minimal otosclerosis at the fistula antifenestrum that didn't require prosthesis. I asked HFS if it would last. He said, yes, if you pick the right cases. This shows a probe doing the anterior curotomy, curotomy and then the laser transection of the anterior portion of the foot plate. At this point, the stapes could become oval if the otosclerosis is confined to the fistula antifenestrum. If it's still fixed, we enlarge the opening and put a prosthesis in. I developed cartilage reinforcement of the round window for severe semicircular canal dehiscence. The results are being presented at the upcoming meeting in 25 cases. I also developed a surgical procedure to help reduce hyperacusis by temporalis reinforcement of the round and oval windows. There are four types of sound hypersensitivity, hyperacusis, recruitment, mesophonia, and phonophobia. Surgery is designed only for the hyperacusis. Hyperacusis is a condition where a person cannot tolerate normal sounds. They become anxious and avoid places like movies, restaurants, and sporting events. It often affects their quality of life. Six to 17 percent of the patient uh, population is affected. Noise trauma is in, prominent in the history in 62 percent. 
Their uncomfortable loudness level, LDL, is below 90 dB. Normal LDLs is 90 to 100. Treatment is using earplugs, tinnitus retraining therapy, cognitive therapy, but many times non-surgical treatment may not be effective. The cause is often unknown, but noise trauma is involved in 62% of the cases. Other causes are cochlear trauma, superior semiotic canal dehiscence, perilymphistula, adverse reaction to medication, and hypermobility of the stapes is a new finding. Possible mechanisms for hyperacusis are impaired neuroplasticity and noise suppression, hypersensitivity of the cochlea to sound, and hypermobility of the stapes. Here's a picture showing the temporalis fascia being used to reinforce the round window. Temporalis fascia is then used to surround the uh, stap stapes bone. Yeah, two. The results are divided into two discomfort groups, the moderate discomfort group to sound with LDLs above 70 dB and a high discomfort group with sound below LDLs of 70 dB. In the moderate discomfort group, 81% are happy with the result and would recommend the surgery. The results lasted in many patients. In the high discomfort group, only 47% would recommend the surgery. So to improve the results of the high discomfort group, we are now enhancing the amount of fascia that we put in for reinforcement. This shows an extra piece of temporalis fascia placed over the reinforced windows and then we place a piece of fascia underneath the posterior part of the tympanic membrane. The results of the last four or five patients have been encouraging. In fact, in the last patient, the LDL was 65 pre-op and 95 post-op, and she was very, very happy. Well, this is my story. I've enjoyed the specialty of otology and neurotology. Never felt it was work. I feel honored to have the privilege of training 50 fellows and counting and making a contribution to science as I was ordered to do by Dr. Shuknek. All this improved the quality of life for many patients. And I owe my success to my training I received at Mass Ioneer, and this is why I love Mass Ioneer. Thank you.